Darren here. With me as always is Bobby the Production Bird. He makes it all the more fun to try and key out this screen. And we're gonna take a look at the Blackmagic 4K production camera. Never have liquids by your camera, by the way. It's not a good idea. So this is a very interesting camera in that its price point is $3,000 and it shoots 4K and then it records to a high, high quality format. So let's go right into the raw specs of it. It has a super, super, super 30 size, so super 35 sized sensor in that range. So it fixes that problem from the original cinema camera where you, could, you had that weird in between sensor size, which didn't really have a lens format that matched it properly. This is a 12 to 24, so it's nice wide for crop sensors. So it's nice wide for this camera as well. Now the sensor, is a global shutter, which is great because you're not gonna get that jello skewing garbage you get with a rolling shutter. This exposes the frame, each frame all at once, whereas rolling shutter exposes top to bottom. This solves that. So the other nice thing about the sensor is that it is darn sharp. I shot a bunch of landscapes in New York and all those little windows in the background had a lot of detail to them. I don't have a 4K test chart to try it on, but I can say, it probably is resolving all of that detail. And it also is very good at handling those fine details. It is not exhibiting much of any moray or aliasing. And that's really good because the previous generation of their cameras did. This sensor, really, really good improvement on that. I tried it against even my toughest of subjects, including Bobby's feathers here, and it's really well controlled. So great. Now you get a bunch of connections here. Can you be quiet? Thank you, good bird. Let's go over the connections. You get USB, which is mostly just for firmware updates, I believe. You get a voltage range of 12 to 30, although on the website it says 11 to 30. So you get a DC jack, you get Thunderbolt, which is limited to things like ultrascopes. You get an SDI out, you get two audio connections, which are quarter inch, which we'll get into. Headphone jack and an LENC remote jack, which should control focus and a few other things. And then you get monitoring. You get this five inch screen. It is a lower resolution, but it is pretty crisp and clear for what it is. It is a five inch screen that is 800 by 480 resolution, which it's not really sufficient for everyday production use, but you know what? I have run around and yeah, you could, but Blackmagic has been pretty clear despite their standard advertising that you know this is mainly just for utility purposes and you should use the SDI output to get yourself a monitor or EVF or whatnot for proper monitoring. But we'll stay on the monitoring for a minute there. You do get some interesting tools. You get focus peaking, which is actually, I really like how it's implemented in this. It's a, ver it's a green only, you don't have any settings on it, but the way they have it set up, I think is really useful. It's really good at handling, well, a lot of times focus peaking can be fooled by high contrast situations, but this one at least is really good at really highlighting what is probably in focus. I've been double checking my polls and been almost spot on just relying on the focus peaking, which is great. Another feature you get to help you judge focus is a two times zoom in, which is great. But two issues I really don't like about it. One, you can't move it around. So say you're recording, you wanna double check your focus. You can only really check the center portion because otherwise you'd have to move the camera. The other thing is, is that to activate the two times zoom, you have to double tap. The screen is apparently not as refined as today's cell phones in that it doesn't always register the taps properly. I've double tapped a lot and sometimes it's ignored me completely and sometimes it brings up the single tap metadata menu. This cage, by the way, is something I picked up uh, just for $115, which is a darn good bargain off of uh, Amazon. You can check the links for it. Basic camera cage so you get all these different connections but uh, you might wanna read my Amazon review of that because there's some quirks to it, but otherwise it's a great value. Let's talk about the noise of this camera because, well, they really don't have any internal processing on this. One of the main things they're telling us is that they wanna give us every bit of goodness from the sensor, all the raw goodness, which is a good, and in this case, a bad thing. The ISO options are limited to 200, 400, and 800. 400 being the native ISO of the sensor, purportedly. Now. There's been some issues that have popped up around that. Some people have discovered a fixed pattern noise, which is basically a noise that isn't just, you know, a dot or granule, it's, it can be a line, it's something that's fixed, it doesn't seem to move. 
And this does seem to exhibit these vertical bands of noise. And it's mostly prominent in the ISO 800, but more oddly, it's more or less prominent depending on which particular camera you're holding. I was thankful that my camera is more controlled in it, but they are still there. And it's one of those things where I think it's perfectly fine. It's reasonable in the amount if you stick to ISO 400 and ISO 200, I think it's practically invisible, but it also depends on your exposure. I did some lens cap on tests and various other tests to try and determine what sets it off. And I tried all the ISOs with the lens cap on and the fixed pattern noise actually almost doesn't show up at all. It's very, very faint, even if I pull a curve to try and bring it out. But then I did a test where I had black, white, and gray with a light streaking across it. And that you can really see how the you know different exposures and different parts of the scene will affect the fixed pattern noise. Some places you'll see it, some places you won't. So that's one of the things that you might have to be accepting of if you want to get into this camera is that that fixed pattern noise might be dependent on the particular camera you get and while Blackmagic has acknowledged it, I'm really not putting any stock in any you know, possible fixes they might come out with because they haven't been very transparent about such fixes. You know, they'll, they'll acknowledge them, but we have no idea if or when they'll actually fix them. Even though if you're shooting a drama or a sci-fi or whatnot where it's natural to have darker areas of the frame, which is where this fixed pattern noise is more apparent, expose that those areas higher than normal and then crush them in post so any of the noise will also be crushed and hopefully become invisible that's usually the way you want to do it now let's talk about these connections see because on their website they have a nice big bold lettering industry standard connections so i'm looking at these connections right here which are quarter inch audio connections which yes those are industry standard if you're talking about guitars this, as you'll notice, is not a guitar. This is a production video camera. And in production video, XLR is the standard. Everyone knows this, and I would be okay with them. I'm okay with them using these connections. I understand that we're saving space, and if it was a, de a decision of these versus nothing, I'll take these. But why are they advertising things that just don't make sense? Now, let's take a look for a second at the HDMI port, because it does not exist. Yeah, for some reason, they left out HDMI, which admittedly, people that are using this for higher-end productions, they, they won't have a need for it because it's got SDI. SDI is the industry standard professional connection. But it has one main disadvantage over HDMI, which is that HDMI has an enormous amount of things that'll work with it, especially with this consumer-ish price level. I shouldn't say consumer's price level, $3,000 is still a lot of money. But I think you get my point that in this price range, there's gonna be a lot of people that don't have eight SDI monitors. And HDMI is much more widely available. It may not be as good and as robust as SDI, but it seems like it would've made perfect sense for them to have HDMI on this. And if they had put it on this, it would've been very widely used. What's even odder is that they have Thunderbolt. And Thunderbolt, if you didn't know, is also used for display purposes. The connection is a display connection, among other things. And there's a dongle that adapts Thunderbolt right to HDMI. No extra power needed. But for some reason, they didn't build the circuitry for it. This cannot do that. It is mainly used for ultrascopes and whatnot. So it's kind of odd that they went out of their way to put that connection and limit it so much. Now, you can use the SDI port and convert that to HDMI, and it's not terribly expensive, and it can work pretty well but you just gotta find your own power solution for it and mount it to something. Another thing about the monitor is that, as you can see, it is highly reflective. So yeah, if you're gonna use this outside, I actually came up and made my own little crappy loop. I just prototyped this. If I really like it, I'll make it out of some plastic. And by the way, well, I would show you, but the bird's on my shoulder. I guess I'll use this shoulder. If you're gonna try and use this, say on a shoulder rig, where a shoulder rig, you wanna have the weight as much over your shoulder as possible. So, you know, the weight's traveling through your body, which is great. Now, a lot of the times you use counterweights to move the center of gravity over your shoulder. Some people don't like to use counterweights or, you know, you might just not have them. So you best want to get the weight as far over as possible. Over here, if you're left-handed, I'm right-handed, but there's a bird on that shoulder. So say you're over here, you're doing your stuff, you got an EVF hooked up, you're seeing everything, great. But then you want to change a setting. Hopefully you have an AC back that you can tell, hey, punch this in or whatnot. Yes, you can run around handheld with it, but as you can see, it just isn't built for that. So if you're buying this camera, expect to rig it. You notice I've got here a power tool battery. 
People for uh, a while now, I've seen on and off, talk about trying to use power tool batteries for cameras. And, you know, in some ways it makes sense, but for this particular camera, it starts to make a lot of sense because you've got this wide voltage range and no particular battery system that's built for it. Uh, the Switchtronics makes a nice battery system for this. It's not too expensive, but still, if you compare it to, say, you know, regular DSLR batteries, it's still much more intensive. You've got to mount it somehow, and it's overall just more expensive. So when you're looking at battery systems, I decided, you know what? I really like to DIY, so let me tinker around with these things. So I'm looking at a bunch of the 12-volt systems, which are pretty small from a lot of different manufacturers, and I'll, uh, I'll post if I come up with anything interesting. You might think, well, is it dangerous to use in my camera, but it really isn't. It's DC power. DC power is pretty basic. So as long as the voltage is right, which you get a wide range on this, and as long as, hey, can you get away from the microphone? Hey, don't, don't, don't bite the microphone. Thanks very much. So as long as you've got the right voltage, which this accepts a wide range, and as long as it's got enough amperage behind it, enough capacity to give it what it needs, DC power should work just fine. I would stay away from those eBay batteries, though, that are used for CCTVs. I've actually, you know what? Oops, sorry, bird. Okay, we're back. We got the bird. We're gonna put them on this shoulder now. So these are the batteries I'm talking about. I have these around for, you know, other types of accessories and just as a general backup. And I mean, they do work, but you no, know, they really just, they're not nearly as reliable and I wouldn't trust that they're gonna reliably power your battery. If you really want reliable power, you're gonna have to stick to the professional variations. Excuse me. Like Anton Bauer, the Sony V1s and Anything else that's made by a reputable camera maker, uh, not camera maker, battery maker. One thing they did do though, which is nice, is they gave us that built-in battery. It doesn't last very long at all, but you know what? I've actually been running around without a battery system. And the one nice thing is that this thing turns on pretty quick. Let's see, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, ready to roll. Turn it off, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, off. That's really actually quite impressive, so. You know, I would just turn it on, turn it off, but some of your settings like iris, if you're using a electronically controlled lens, will they'll, they'll change. So it's not quite nice in that you'll have to double check all your settings just to be sure nothing has changed. So where are we at with this camera? Basically, we know that they're not a camera company. As long as you can be okay with that and understand that you can't expect the same things from them as you will, as you can from bigger manufacturers, it's kind of a good thing and a bad thing. In a good way, they're giving us as much as they can out of this camera. It's pretty obvious a lot of the cameras you buy these days from big manufacturers are crippled. You just know that the hardware in there is capable of more. This is the one instance where a camera company, they're trying to give you every bit that they can out of the hardware that they've got in there. But of course, it also shows us the sheer limitation of their the resources. I don't know if they got one poor guy over there programming all their updates, but it, it's slow. There's no audio meters. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that even the other cameras still don't have audio meters, which is odd. Uh, you can't even do simple things like format an SSD in the camera. You gotta do that on the computer. You can't even delete a shot in camera. You gotta do that on the computer. You know, so li limited resources, absolutely. My advice, if you're gonna go into the, any sort of Blackmagic camera system, Buy it for what it is. Don't expect any updates. If they come, great. And the funny thing is, is I mean, this thing didn't even ship with RAW. You know, they're, they're really pushing that whole RAW aspect, but this, it only ships with ProRes. Now, to be fair, ProRes is awesome. It's great, it's beautiful. RAW, yeah, it's better. But keep in mind, the ProRes that's in this is 880 megabits. You're talking about five gigabytes a minute. So I really wouldn't suggest this for documentary films. The amount of data that's gonna pile up on you is enormous, and we're not even yet talking about raw. We don't yet know exactly what the raw data is gonna be like, but, ow. Okay, bird is dealt with, but anyways, I was saying, the sheer amount of data is daunting, and you really should consider things very carefully if you're planning using this for small productions, running gun and whatnot, because the, the data workflow is intense compared to other camera systems. One thing I really wish they would have done, but I understand that why they didn't, because it would have added more time and whatnot, is I wish they would have gone for the EOS M mount. This is a standard EF mount. You can see just how much it protrudes from the body. The EOS M mount is Canon's mirrorless mount, which is far shorter in flange distance, so it probably could have been almost flush against the body. 
And the nice thing about that mount is, is that they've made an easy adapter that goes right from EOSM to EF. So we would have gotten the benefits of EF and any other sensor we, and, excuse me, any other lens we could have adapted that would cover this size sensor. Now, since this thing is called a production camera, well, a lot of productions like to use PL lenses. And PL, there's extremely few amount of lenses you can actually adapt EF to PL to. I don't think any prime lenses work, and there's only a few zooms that actually work on it. But if they had put the EOS M mount, we could have easily adapted PL glass to it. I don't particularly use PL glass myself, but a lot of people would. And when you're calling a camera a production camera, you know, that would have been a good idea. But again, I understand at any changes to the hardware in this would have delayed it even further, but that's what it is. So I'm still on the fence about whether or not I want to keep this camera for a number of reasons, mainly because yeah, I do feel a bit like a beta tester and I do really, really like the image that comes out of this camera, but I kind of have the feeling I want to give it back and then if and when Blackmagic does fix everything and it feels more like a well put together refined camera, then, you know, invest in it because it is an investment. Even though its price point is only $3,000, which is a darn good bargain for what it is, it still is an investment and you got to make sure you're going to get good use out of your investments and it's going to perform well beyond its price point. No doubt about that. But I would just go into it believing that Blackmagic is never going to do anything to improve it. it. Sounds harsh, but I think that's the cold reality is that buy it for what it is today. And obviously make sure you buy it from a reputable dealer so that if you do see a lot of that fixed pattern noise and you think you got a unit that's a little more susceptible to it, return it, get a different one. So that is the final word I have for you on the Blackmagic 4K cinema camera. Bobby, anything to add? Yes, but he said his name, Bobby. Very good input. All right, I'm Darren Levine, Bobby the Production Bird, Media Halo with the Black Magic 4K production camera.